Michael, I see so many people that think they're born empty and that whenever they get into life, they get out of school and they get into life, whatever that looks like for them, that then their job they feel is to fill their empty self up. I've got to mm -hmm. have the, the greatest education and drive the nicest car and make the most money and have the latest gizmos and, and gadgets. And somehow that's going to make me happy. That's going to make me fulfilled. And what I've found is it's just the opposite. We're not yeah. born empty. We're born full with everything we need to be successful, however you define that word in your life, already inside us. And so our job should not be to fill ourselves up. Our job should be to empty ourselves out with mm. our unique gifts and talents, certainly for the betterment of ourselves, but also for the betterment of our families, of our friends, of our communities, of our countries. You are listening to The Dr. Haley Show, the podcast dedicated to helping you optimize your health. Each episode, there will be an interview or a message to help you discover better health. We will be featuring health radicals on the show to bring new ideas to the table, as well as doubling down on key fundamentals to support you living your best life. Your host is no other than the founder of Haley Nutrition, Dr. Michael Haley. I'm Dr. Michael Haley, and this is the Dr. Haley Show podcast. My guest today is Terry Tucker. He's author of the book, Sustainable Excellence, 10 Principles to Leading Your Uncommon and Extraordinary Life. He's a sought after speaker who uses the power of real life stories to motivate, inspire, and encourage others. He went from being an NCAA Division I basketball player to SWAT team hostage negotiator to cancer warrior. His cancer eventually led to amputation of his foot in 2018 and then his leg in 2020. Yet somehow he embraces the pain and the difficulty and he uses it to become stronger and more determined. He's appeared on literally hundreds of podcasts. This one is one of the good ones, very inspiring. I believe the way I can help you the most is by convincing you to subscribe to his YouTube channel at Sustainable Excellence and take his weekly, well, not devotional, but inspirational. You've heard of daily devotionals. Terry delivers weekly inspirationals. They're about five minutes long and they typically have a real life story of someone who did something great. You might want to pause and subscribe right now and then come back and take in this podcast. I have a link in the resources section below the video and below the podcast. Early in the podcast, we talk a lot about Terry's cancer. That is not what this podcast is about, but it sets the stage for who he is and it kind of well demonstrates the principles that he shares. So enjoy. I gotta say, I'm pretty impressed with you. You've created a ton of content. From what I see, you're completely underrated and we need to change that. Well, thank you. I do this because I need to have a purpose when I'm not in cancer treatment. And it's never been about getting known or making money or doing any of that. I mean, whatever comes, comes. I've always said, I've, you know, I've probably been on 700 podcasts and I don't think I've ever been on one that I shouldn't have been on. I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing, so. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting too, because my audience is largely going to be able to relate to you. A lot of them have had cancer at one time or are currently fighting it. Uh, and a lot of them have taken different routes. I'm curious. I, and I hope it's, uh, okay to ask some of the questions. You seem yeah, like the kind of guy that can want. answer anything. Yeah, sure. Uh, where are you at right now in your cancer treatment? How's it going? How have things changed over the past couple of years? So in, in a lot of ways, I'm lucky. I, and I always say I've been trying to die of cancer for the last 12 years and haven't been very successful at it. So I do poke fun at my disease and my treatment a lot. I, I use humor a lot. I am on a clinical trial drug now that does nothing to the cancer. But, and you probably know this, but the way cancer proliferates in the body is it secretes an enzyme or a protein that hides itself from your immune system. And what this drug does is go in 
and remove that protein and that enzyme so that my own immune system, just like if you have a cold virus or a flu virus, can say, hey, wait a minute, this doesn't belong here. We've got to attack it. So it's actually my own body that is keeping me stable. And it's a trial drug, so it's not available to the general public at this point in time. I've been on it for three years. The trial ended almost two years ago. Um, it got fast tracked from what my study coordinator told me for, and I don't remember if it's ovarian or cervical cancer, one of those two. So the FDA is fast tracking it to treat that, but not melanoma, which is what I have, but it works for me. And everybody else who was on the trial at the University of Colorado with me, unfortunately has passed away. And I'm kind of the last person standing. So I've been doing this for the last three years. It's a very intensive treatment. I go to the hospital every three weeks, every day for a week. And I'm there for like seven hours and I get treated with this drug and then I have a reaction. And I do that three week cycle and I've been doing it for three years now. And that was one of the downsides of the trial is that it's too labor intensive. It's not like you go once a month and get an infusion and you're done. No, you go every single day for six or seven hours and then you get two weeks off and then you do it again and then you do it again. And then and people are like, I'm not doing that. It's, it's too labor intensive. Well, I'm brain damaged enough that I do do that. So. <laughs> Well, tell me the why behind it, though, because I've heard you say it on another video, why you chose to do this trial. Because it's more than likely it's not going to save my life. I mean, sooner or later, this probably isn't going to work anymore. But one of the things I learned, I, I you, you can't tell this from looking at me, but I'm six foot eight inches tall. And I went to college on a basketball scholarship. And so I started playing team sports when I was like nine and played all the way up until I graduated when I was 21. And one of the things that team sports taught me was the importance of being part of something that's bigger than yourself. But you realize on a team that if you don't do your job, not only do you let yourself down, but you let your teammates down, your coaches down, your fans down, et cetera. And if you think about it, the biggest team game that we all play is this game of life. So the way I look at this trial is maybe it won't save my life, but maybe five years from now, 10 years from now, based on all of the blood tests and the scans and everything that the doctors are doing on me, they can use that information to maybe somewhere down the road, it does save someone's life and they can be with their family longer and things like that. So it's, I look at it as it's, it's helping me now, absolutely. But I also look at it as it's something bigger than me as well. Yeah, and perspective, wow, that's amazing. If more people were like you, what a world this place would be. I love I, it. I guess I've just been lucky. I, I mean, I, I'm very fortunate in my life. I was raised by great parents, have a great family. It's just the way I look at it. I realize a lot of people don't, and I see that. I mean, when you're sick, it tends to be, it's, it's all about me. Look at, look at me, this is terrible. And, and, and one thing I think cancer does is it isolates us. I think it isolates us from our friends initially, and then our family. And then if you have it long enough, it isolates you from yourself. I mean, who are you? What, I mean, are, is your whole identity? I mean, I've been doing this for 12 years and I had a nurse ask me, I had treatment last week. She said, are you your cancer? I said, no, no, this is, this is part of me. I would say, but I am not cancer. Cancer doesn't dictate my life or who I am or what I do. How much of that isolation have you experienced? A lot. I mean, especially since COVID, I, I mean, I have melanoma tumors in my lungs. So during COVID, it was literally, we hunkered down. I mean, I didn't leave the house except to go for treatment to the hospital. Um, I, I had my leg amputated in the middle of the COVID pandemic. I will never forget that, that it was, my doctor had to get special permission because surgeries were all shut down unless it was an absolute emergency. And his argument was, well, his tumor has broken his leg. I can't set it. It's not going to heal. We need to take his leg off. So we had to get special permission. But the morning of the surgery, my wife literally dropped me off at the hospital. There was a nurse waiting for me with a wheelchair, put me in a wheelchair, wheeled me back to the pre-op room, which was this big cavernous room with, that's divided into like 30 different bays where it's supposed to be pre prepping people for all kinds of surgery. And I was the only person in that room. Yeah. 
and I was supposed to be in the hospital for 10 days to two weeks. They sent me home after having my leg amputated after 48 hours because of COVID. Wow. Wow. <laughs> yeah. No, but when you interact with your friends now, the COVID's gone and passed. Uh, do you feel like they're always thinking, oh, I have to dance around what I talk about because Terry has cancer? Or do they maybe, does it not seem that way so much with you? I mean, it doesn't. And I think part of it is, is how I handle it, how I present myself. And like I say, I use humor. I'm, I'm self-deprecating. I I make jokes. Yeah. Hey, I, I got to go buy shoes. I'm glad they're half off because I only have one. Left. I mean, I, <laughs> I I do try to make jokes about it. And I think that puts people at ease. And it, But it, I mean, you make a great point. I mean, there were people when I got cancer that I was 100% sure would stay with me, would be in my corner, would be in that foxhole with me that were like, mm, Terry, I, I, I can't deal with this. I can't. You're, I was 51 years old when I was basically told, I'd be dead in two years. And I was like, what do you mean? You're, I need you. You've been my friend for a long time. And then there were other people yeah. that I never expected to be there for me that yeah. haven't left my side. So, you know, I think a lot of it is how you present yourself. I mean, if you're down and gloomy and you're, you're the Debbie Downer kind of person, you're not going to have, I don't care who you are. You're not going to have any people around you because people don't want that kind of energy flowing through them. So I try to be as upbeat and positive and happy as I possibly can. Yeah. And I, I think part of that too, is your comfort zone. Meaning I've heard you talk about being comfortable in the uncomfortable. And it's one of those things like confrontation is not a fear. Um, something new is not a fear. If I'm doing the same thing, I have nothing to gain, nothing to learn, but in a new situation, there's so much to learn, so much more that can happen and change. And you seem to have that where you embrace the, the uncomfortable, the new, the, I don't know what's coming next. Yeah. Embrace the suck for, for lack of a better term. This, this sucks. I don't like it. I don't like the cards that I've been dealt, but I'm going to have to play them to the best of my ability. And I think part of that is I am a naturally curious person. I, I want to know things. Why are you doing that? I know I don't have a medical degree or anything like that, but explain that to me. What, what's going on there? And it's it's amazing when you kind of get involved or advocate for yourself in, in your own health care, how people want to explain things to you. Oh, that's what that means. I was listening to your podcast with Amy Wilson, the, the dietitian from Kentucky, before we jumped on, and you were talking about nutrition and things like that. I mean, nobody ever talked to me about nutrition. But I remember one of the diagnostic tools my doctor used to use was what's called a PET scan, which in simplistic terms is basically injecting you with radioactive sugar with the idea being that cancer cells have a higher metabolism. They will pick up that sugar and glow on your scan. And I thought, well, sugar, mm, cancer's taking up that sugar. Maybe I shouldn't be eating as much sugar as I, I, I mean, it's, it's more of looking at things and trying to figure out how you can interrelate with those things. What, what makes sense? Or no, I shouldn't do that. Or I should do more of this or things like that. And so I've just always been a naturally curious person. Right. And while I'm the sort of guinea pig in this, it's still kind of cool for me to be involved in it. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I hear that. And for people listening in right now, we're talking about cancer. This podcast is going to be more about leadership principles. But we're talking about cancer right now, and I and we're going to go a little bit further in this area, and then we're going to get to the the meat of what makes Terry Tucker who he is, and why he handles it this way, and how you can apply some of these principles in your life. There's only gain to happen on this podcast. We're all going to take something home. I'm going to. You're going to. We're all going to benefit. Terry's going to. <laughs> In this cancer journey, when you jump in a clinical study, I don't know the answer to this question. I know a lot of people do this. Are there rules such as you can't do any other treatments or you can't change your diet or how does that work? There are rules. There, there's an entire form that you fill out and it's a multi-page form. And, and some of the questions are hilarious. I'm in my 60s. I've been married to my wife for 30 years. And one of the questions is, are you thinking of having children? 
I'm like, yeah, no, I think we're done with that. It's like, and then it was, are you sure? Are you sure you don't want to check with your wife? I'm like, if my wife is having children, there's a star rising in the east and wise men are coming on far. You know, I, I said, so no, but I mean, yes, there are rules. There are things that, for example, I, I was reading an article about DHA, the fatty fish oil that is supposed to be good for your heart. And I read an article that these doctors in Portugal had used that and somehow found that it was like a Trojan horse for cancer and that the, the cancer would pick out the, the DHA and they would die. And so I immediately, I have, I'm lucky I, I am at a university setting. So I have access to an oncology pharmacist. And I, I called her up, said, Christina, I'd like to do DHA. What do you think? And she was like, well, let me check. Let me see if it's within the parameters of the study. And she came back and she said, it is within the parameters of the study, but we don't want you to do it because I had a blood clot back in 2017. I'm on a blood thinner and DHA thins your blood even more. So she said, there's that risk of bleeding. We, we would prefer you not do it. I'm good with that. If you can explain it to me and tell me why I should or shouldn't do it, right. I'm, I'm good with that. So yes, there are, you, yeah. and, and part of it is when you start a study, a lot of it depends on what previous treatment you've had. It's like, if you've done yeah. chemotherapy, you can't do this study. So there's a lot of, yeah, there's a lot of I's to dot and T's to cross in order to do Yeah, that. yeah. In that situation, I might have said, okay, can we cut back the blood thinner and ease this in and measure the my blood viscosity? I don't know what the test for that is, but yeah, I'm sure there's ways to make that stuff happen too. But that's kind of what I'm getting at because if we look at a statistic, for instance, if we take one of the worst cancers, pancreatic cancer, and there's a 2% survival rate, I'm going to look at that and say, okay, why 2%? What did the 2% do that the 98% didn't? Or what makes them different than the rest? Could it possibly be something in their life, the way they think, the way they sleep, the way they eat, could their lifestyle be contributing to the reason why they're in that 2%? I don't know. I mean, how do we know? Yeah, I mean, but you make a great point. I mean, and you really do. And I, I, think, I think that's true, but I think a bigger part of it is just our genetics. Because there are, from what my doctor's telling me, now they're getting to the point in gene therapy where they're able to say, okay, this medication, for example, for breast cancer, if you have this particular gene or this particular anomaly in your gene, mm -hmm. we know it's not going to work for you, even though it's a therapy for breast cancer. So we're not even going to give it to you because we know it won't work based on your genetic makeup. And I think they're finding more and more of that where there's such a nuance, there's such a little tweak between your genome and my genome that, hey, it would work for me, but it wouldn't work for you. Okay, great. But yes, on top of what you're saying, how do you eat? How do you exercise? How do you sleep? What's your stress level? All those kind of things. It, it's, it's sort of the totality of the circumstances. You look at everything. Are you enjoying the show thus far? One of the many health secrets that we have covered on the show is all around aloe vera, specifically drinking raw aloe vera. Our aloe vera has helped our customers effectively heal their gut, increase their intestine health, lower inflammation in the body, eliminate and or decrease acid reflux, have glowing skin and hair, and so much more. Now, as a frequent member of our audience, you will be exposed to exclusive specials and coupon codes for the awesome products manufactured by Haley Nutrition. That's right, for simply being awesome and tuning in, you can get a mini discount to help you optimize and better your health. To see how we can help and support you on your health journey, Tune into the episodes and listen for coupon codes that you can use at www.haleynutrition.com before you make your orders of raw aloe vera. Once again, it's www.haleynutrition.com. Now, back to the show. Yeah, yeah, and there's different approaches to treating cancer. There's an all-medical approach. There's an integrative approach where you do what the doctors think that you should be doing and you also do your natural treatments whether possibly guided by a different physician or on your own whatever you're choosing to do and then there's an all-natural approach and 
we don't know what the best approach is. We're learning. I applaud you for choosing to participate for the sake of helping others uh, down the road. And I'm expecting good things for you. I, you. When I hear you, when I see you, I see your perspective on things. I know that you're making good chemistry in just the way you think. Our chemistry is our, our nutrition. It's what operates our body. There's something that was written in scriptures and it said something like a broken spirit is like drying to the bones, but a joyful spirit is healing. And as we think good things, we're actually making healing chemistry, healing nutrition for our bodies. So I hear a lot of biblical principles in the things you say and teach, but I never hear you saying the book of Proverbs says, or this or that. Where do you get a lot of your, your knowledge from? Well, my wife has been in biblical catechetical school apologetics for years, and, and I have a very incredibly strong faith. I'm not a Bible quoter. I, I kind of want to live it more than <laughs> I want to say it. And that, and so faith is very important to me. And, and I always am learning about my faith. I've been a cradle Catholic. I've been a Catholic my entire life. And as I get older, my wife goes through these classes and stuff. Man, I wish I would have learned that when I was younger and things like that. I, again, being curious and things like that. So I do use a lot of biblical, I'm writing a second book and I'm going through it for a second time now. And I was like, gosh, this sounds very religious. And I, I and there's nothing wrong with religion. Don't get me wrong, but I, I, I didn't start out to make it a, a religious book. I mean, there are certain things that are important to me that I want to put out there, but I, I never wanted to be, well, it says in the Bible and that's the way it's got to be. I'm not one of those people, but I do, I do have a very strong faith in God. And I, I, a hundred percent, like I said, I mean, 12 years ago, they told me I would be dead in two years. And I thought, well, you gave me a death sentence. Maybe I can turn that death sentence into a life sentence. And there have been so many times along this journey where I should have been dead. I had a fever of 108 degrees at one point. I was in the intensive care. Unit. That's usually not compatible with being alive. No. Somehow I survived that, which is nothing I did. It was, must have been something bigger than me. Yeah, yeah. Well, I like your your perspective. I like the fact that you're living it. You don't have to quote and say, well, it comes from here or there. We are to be the fragrance of Christ. We're to represent him, to reflect him. People should see him in us, but we don't have to say why you see this, where our joy comes from. They just know. Yeah. People just know. So good stuff. Let's talk about your book. Okay. And I'm curious about every single key word in the title, sustainable excellence. What does that mean? Yeah, so let's break it down. Excellence, what does that mean? I don't know. And, and, and I say this, I, I don't know. I, and, I, and the weird reason I say that is because I think excellence is like beauty. It's sort of in the eye of the beholder. Michael, you and I may look at a sports team or a band or, or whatever, and, and you may say, man, they are excellent. And I may say, yeah, I think they're good, but I don't necessarily think they're excellent. So I think you as an individual have to determine what excellence looks like in your life. But once you've determined that, how do you sustain that excellence? Or once you get to that point, how do you sustain that excellence? What do most people do? They get to the end of the rainbow. They get to the top of the mountain. They kind of kick back, they put their feet up on the desk, pour themselves a drink, and they're like, man, I've arrived. And then what happens? Six months, a year later, boom, somebody passes them up. And you're like, wait a minute, what happened? What happened is everybody watched how you did what you did, and then they innovated. They found different ways to deliver their service. They found different customers to do it with, and they passed you up. And that's where the sustainable part comes in. How do you sustain it? You continue to grow. It's the old saying, if you're not growing, you're dying. So if you're not finding different ways, different services, different ways to innovate, then you're dying. Your business is dying. Your life is dying. And that's kind of where that came from. I, I want people to understand that you can be excellent and you can also sustain it. But it means growth, constant growth. It goes back to me. I'm curious. How can we yeah. do that? What are the words that we can do? How can we make different customers? How can we flip this on its head and make it something different. And so many people just kind of get 
I think tunnel vision, it's like, well, this is the way it's got to be. Why? Why does it have to be that yeah. way? And you're also implying that there's always another level. You might be living an excellent life right now, but that doesn't mean you're doing your absolute best that you'll ever achieve. It does. And, and that's, I think back on my life, I look at, at, at my life, my goal was always to follow in my grandfather's footsteps. I wanted to be in law enforcement. I wanted to be a police officer, but my grandfather was actually shot in the line of duty. He was a Chicago police officer from 1924 to 1954. And in 1933, he was shot with his own gun in the ankle, not a serious injury, but my dad always remembered the stories. My dad was an infant at the time that my grandmother used to tell of that knock on the door of Mrs. Tucker, grab your son, come with us. Your husband's been shot. And so when I expressed an interest in doing that, my dad was like, absolutely not. You're going to college. You're going to major in business. You're going to get out, get married, have 2.4 kids and live happily ever after. <laughs> but that's what my dad wanted me to live. That's not what I felt my purpose was. And one of the things I am most proud of in my life is that I never let that dream die. I never let my purpose die. At, at the time I switched to be a police officer, I'd been a hospital administrator. I was making good money. It was a comfortable job. I didn't have to basically turn my life upside down, my family's life upside down, but it was in me. It was in my soul. It was in my heart. It was something I knew I was supposed to do. So at 37 years old, I became a rookie police officer. You're already getting ahead of me. Sorry. All right. All right. Let's, let's go back. Forget that. Cut that out. <laughs> No, it's funny because what you're describing is the principles to leaving your uncommon and extraordinary life. I was hoping you would also explain what you meant by those terms. Yeah, I mean, uncommon and extraordinary. I think we settle in life. So many people settle. There's a there's an entrepreneur by the name of Ed Milet, and it, and he he talks about the four types of people in the world, and I, and I love the way he describes it. He says the first type are the unmotivated. And he said, that's the vast majority of people that you will encounter in your life. He said, the second group are the motivated, where it's more of a carrot and stick approach to life. If I do this, I will get that. It's a life simply based on motivation. It's kind of low level, but it works for a ton of people. And then the third group he talks about are the inspirational people. The word inspiration coming from two words, in spirit. If you're an inspirational person, you move people with your energy. And then the last group he talks about are the aspirational people, where people aspire to be like you. And sometimes if, I, if I'm giving a, a talk or something, and depending on, you have to feel out the audience a little bit, I, I'll tell that story and I'll be like, all right, show of hands, how many of you are unmotivated? And nobody raises their hand. Nobody ever says, yes, I'm in that group where the vast majority of people are. And I think that's, that's the issue, we settle. We get to a point where it's comfortable and I don't want to mess with it. And that's just our brains. And, I, and I'm getting ahead of you again. I'm sorry. But that's no, just it's our, great. <laughs> that's just our brain saying we don't like the status quo, the way things are right now. It's comfortable and familiar and just leave it alone. But it goes mm. back to what we were talking about a minute ago. The only way you're going to grow, the only way you're going to improve, the only way you're going to get better is if you step outside those comfort zones and you do things that make you uncomfortable which is why I always used to tell my players, you need to get comfortable being uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah. What about selfishness for, be, compared to selflessness and how it relates to your overall happiness and enjoyment of life? <clears throat> so I'll, uh, I'll tell you a story, I guess, I think that, that kind of illustrates that. I mean, most of us that are probably listening to this either know of or heard of Mr. Rogers, Fred Rogers on his television show, Mr. Rogers Neighborhood, educated so many young people, including me. On public I watched television. him every day. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's amazing. I, I've got his bio, biography back there that I, that I just read a couple months ago. And I, I remember when hearing the story when he died in 2003, and I can't believe it's been that long, that his family was going through his effects and they found his wallet. And inside his wallet, was a scrap piece of paper on which, on which Mr. Rogers had written four simple words. Life is for service. And I, I love that story. And I think if you sort of keep that in mind, 
that your life is really, it's not about what you can get. Michael, I see so many people that think they're born empty and that whenever they get into life, they get out of school and they get into life, whatever that looks like for them, that then their job they feel is to fill their empty self up. I've got to mm. have the greatest education and drive the nicest car and make the most money and have the latest gizmos and, and gadgets. And somehow that's going to make me happy. That's going to make me fulfilled. And what I've found is it's just the opposite. We're not yeah. born empty. We're born full with everything we need to be successful, however you define that word in your life, already inside us. And so our job should not be to fill ourselves up. Our job should be to empty ourselves out with mm. our unique gifts and talents, certainly for the betterment of ourselves, but also for the betterment of our families, of our friends, of our communities, of our countries, et cetera. Yeah. But I, I, I think selfishness is built in us all probably for survival to some extent. And there's some truth in love yourself so that you can love others. Sure. You do have to take care of yourself so that you can be there for the other people. So I recognize selfishness is built in for survival, but it's certainly not a road to happiness. I, I don't think so. I, I think we learned that lesson in COVID that we're not good alone. We're not good when it's just all about me. When we were isolated, you saw alcoholism rates go up, domestic violence rates go up, divorce rates go up. We're better together. We need each other to be successful. Nobody is successful in a vacuum. There's always people behind the scenes that got that person at the top of the mountain. I'm Dr. Michael Haley, interrupting this podcast to let you know we have a special at Haley Nutrition today and a site-wide coupon. If you head over to the shop, you'll see that while supplies last, we only have a limited number of these battery-powered mixers, you can get one free with your single can purchase of Aya Greens vegetable and fruit powder. Lately, I've been using mine every day to make my greens, and I also like to froth up my organic cold coffee mixed in coconut milk with Haley Vegan Protein, my morning treat. And you probably know we rarely discount our raw frozen aloe vera because the profit margin is a little rough in the frozen food industry. But to thank you for tuning in to the Dr. Haley Show podcast throughout the month of May 2024, use the coupon code JUICE, J-U-I-C-E, to get 5% off your entire purchase, including our specials and including our famous raw frozen aloe vera gel health drink. All right, let me let you get back to the podcast. Let's talk about reprogramming our brains a little bit. I know there's some different techniques and we probably all need a little brainwashing in a good sense. That is, we have stuff in our brains that has been put there that is not beneficial to us and it'd be great if we could wash it out. Sometimes we get stuck dwelling on the challenges of life and we get in this rut and we focus on how bad things are instead of how good they are. What are some techniques for changing the direction of our thoughts that you've learned to employ in your own life? I think part of it is how we look at life. When I go for treatment, I know it's going to be ugly. I know I'm going to hurt. I know there's going to be pain. But I have a choice of how to look at that. Do I get to go to treatment or do I have to go to treatment? And believe me, I mean, my, my wife will tell you this. There are sometimes on that Sunday night before that Monday morning where I'm sitting at the dinner table, I, I do not want to do this. I do not want to go to treatment. I mean, I mean you're, you're looking at me right now. There's no S on my chest. I do not have a cape and fly around with magical powers. I mean, I have those bad days. I have that ugliness, but it's still a choice for me. For I, you. I, I yeah. kind of see the yes on your shirt. I'm sorry. <laughs> I've watched enough of your content. <laughs> Something's there. <laughs> well, I appreciate you saying that, but, but it's, it, I just, I don't want people to think that, oh yeah, this guy's got all the answers. And so I, I don't have all the answers. I, I'm a human being just like everybody else. I have those bad days. But I also understand I have a choice. 
I have a choice whether to say, well, I, I get to go to treatment tomorrow. It, it may help me. It may keep my tumors stable. There's all the positive. I have to do this. Oh, this is going to suck. It's terrible. It's going to be painful. It's going to be ugly. Yeah, it is. But can you embrace that ugliness? Can you embrace that pain? And that's one thing I, I always recommend to people. And I recommend it because I do it every day of my life. Do one thing every day that makes you nervous, that scares you, that makes you uncomfortable, that's potentially embarrassing. It doesn't have to be a big thing. But if you do those small things every day, as you know, Michael, like when the big disasters in life hit us in our lives, like somebody close to us dies, we get let go from our job unexpectedly, find out we have a chronic or a terminal illness, you'll be so much more resilient to handle those things than the people who stay in their comfort zones and be like, this is comfortable, this is easy, I don't wanna get outside. Because that disaster, those ugly, that hits every one of us. There's nobody who's immune to that pain happening to them. So understand, why not make yourself resilient to it? Like I said, it doesn't have to be a big thing. Do something you don't want to do. I, I read an article that said 33% of Americans, so a third of the country, admits to hitting the snooze button at least three times every morning. What if you didn't hit that snooze button? Or what if you put your alarm clock in the bathroom that forced you to get out of bed to do that? How much more time would you, even if you had 20 minutes, 30 minutes, what could you do with that 30, 20 minutes? Because there's the rule of 100, that if you spend 100 hours a year doing something, which is 18 minutes a day, you'll be better than 95% of the world at what that is. Playing the piano, writing, whatever that ends up being in your life. That's the snooze button right there. There's that 18 minutes of your life that you could use for something positive and that would allow you to grow as a human being. Yeah, that's good. What time do you get up in the morning? I get up around 5.30. I, I do, because I'm in a wheelchair, and so I do exercises in bed for my back and, and things like that. So probably get out of bed about an hour later, about 6.30. Wow, and there's a lesson in that right there proactive. Here I am. I've got this against me, but it doesn't mean I can't exercise. In fact, I'm going to start with exercise. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And, and I've always liked to exercise. I've always been a physical individual. So that wasn't too hard for me. It, it's been much harder knowing that I was a college basketball player, that I was a police officer, that I was on the SWAT team. And now I don't have a left leg and I'm in a wheelchair. So how do you balance that? And I, I think when you can't do what you were good at, you do what's important. And I think that's what I'm doing right now in my life. Yeah, I, my wife and I, we like to get up early. Her first thing is exercise. Well, after coffee for both of us. Spend 10 minutes having our coffee. She goes in the garage at about 4.35 in the morning and she's doing her yoga before she goes to teach yoga. So it's our in the morning of her own thing. And then she's exercising all day long at work. Now, while she's in the garage, I'm in the living room playing my drums at 4.35 in the morning. But your neighbors <laughs> love that, huh? <laughs> From what I see, we have people that are out early because it's funny because I'm looking out my front window and people are walking by and I always wonder if, I, if they can hear it. And a lot of them just keep on going. Other people will pause and kind of do I hear something? So <laughs> <laughs> it's loud in the house, but uh, I, when the kids are there, I can't can't play the drums. But when they are Understand. not, there's a good there's a good hour of loud noise and sweat, and that's my exercise. Good for you. But <laughs> fun stuff. Explain what is meant when you were born. You cried, and the world rejoiced live your life in such a way that when you die, the world cries and you rejoice. Yeah, that's a, a Native American Blackfoot proverb that I that I heard years ago. And I I talk about that a lot on podcasts because when I when I had my leg amputated and I found out I had these tumors in my lungs, I went with my wife to the mortuary, to the cemetery, uh, and to the church and I planned my funeral. And because I go on podcasts like this and talk about you know, mindset, motivation, self-improvement, or I give talks in person, I actually had some people that 
gave me some brushback that said somehow planning my funeral was in some way defeatist. And I had to remind those people that the last time I checked, I think we're all going to die. I don't think anybody's working on a cure for life right now. Every one of us is going to die, but not every one of us is really going to live. And I think the most important words in that quote that you just gave are live your life. I mean, you started out this way and, and the world reacted. Now you have an opportunity to live your life in such a way that when you die, the world cries and you rejoice. And I, I don't know if you remember years ago, there was a, a mini series called Band of Brothers that was out. It was it, it followed the 507th Para-Infantry para Regiment during World War II. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the, the mini series, they talk about the individual soldiers. And th these were real soldiers, obviously being played by Hollywood characters. And there was a guy by the name of George Luz. And they say at the end of that, that when George Luz died in like 1998, as a testament to his character, 1900 people showed up at his funeral. George Luz wasn't a CEO. He didn't run some big company or some big organization. He'd been a handyman in Providence, Rhode Island. And I, I think that's, that's what live your life is about. You yeah. don't have to be rich, powerful, successful, important, influential. None of that matters. None of that goes with you afterwards. It's the connections that we make with each other. One of my nurses who treats me in the infusion center used to be a hospice nurse. And for those of your audience who don't know what hospice is, it's, it's end of life care. And she gave me a book to read called Imagine Heaven. And it's a book about near-death experiences. And I, I took a lot of things away from that. One of the things I thought was incredibly interesting was that people who are born totally deaf or totally blind during a near-death experience can hear and see. And then, I mean, how horrible must that be for them that they can hear? And then medical science brings them back and now they're, they can't hear, they can't see again. But the other thing that I found interesting about the book is that no matter who the person was that died, whoever they saw during that experience, whether it was Jesus or Allah or a saint or an angel or a friend or a relative, the one question that everybody, almost everybody got asked was, how do you treat my people? In other words, if you think back on the Bible, you think back on what Jesus, what's the most important commandment? You know, love your God above all else. What's the second? Love your neighbor as yourself. That was the second part of that commandment. How do you treat each other? How do we connect with each other? And I think that's such an important part today. If I'm going to be remembered for anything in my life, and I'm not going to be remembered, nobody's going to remember 100 years from now that I was here. But what I want to do now is connect. I want to have connections with other human beings. And I think that's incredibly important. And I apologize for the long-winded answer, but that's... No, it's a good one. And whether or not you're remembered in 100 years or not, you don't really know that. But by the people that definitely interacted with you direct, okay, they're no longer here either. Exactly. But there's, okay. that, there's, there's always that legacy, that dash. Yeah. What's your legacy? There's certain names that are just never going to be used again, ever. And if you do a search for them on Facebook... They're nowhere to be found. No one names their kids with those certain names because people have completely stained those names in history. And then there's other names that people want to name their kids after. And because, wow, remember there were so many, well, Billy, Billy Graham, that's a great name. Billy's a great name. There's biblical names that uh, of great people and prophets. And yeah, I want to name my kids after that person. So we never know how long our legacy is going to live on after we're gone, but there sure are a lot of people that we can touch today Yeah, that can influence the world. You never know if the person you influence is going to be the next Billy Graham. You never know. You, you don't. And, and, and I'll, I'll tell you a quick story. One, again, all I got is basketball and nurse story. So this is a nurse story again. This was a nurse who, young lady, about 25, already a nurse, but was learning how to do things on the unit where I get treated. And about six months later, she was taking care of me. She came in one time and she said, Tara, I've got a story I want to tell you, but I'm a little bit uncomfortable telling it to you. 
Michael, I was like, how do you respond to that? What do you say to somebody who says that to you? And I'm like, well, I hope you decide you want Bring to tell it. me. I, I think I would enjoy it. So she's in and out for the next couple hours and then finally comes in and sits down. It's like, right, here's the story. She said, when I first met you, I was going to get out of nursing. She said, I had a very good friend of mine die and I was in a really dark place. I talked to my family. I was going to quit nursing. I was going to go to work for Amazon. And then I met you and I see what you go through. You keep coming back for these treatments. And I went back in your file and I read your entire history of cancer. And she said, when I finished reading your background, I knew I was where I was supposed to be. Now, if she would have never told me that story, I would have had no idea that my life had had a positive impact on her. And for all those people who are listening to us right now, I guarantee you there are people out there, you may not even know who they are, that are watching how you handle your struggles, the adversity in your life, and see your courage and would give almost everything they have to walk five minutes in your shoes. So you make a great point. We have no idea who we influence in life. Yeah, one of the things I like to ask people is, what's a story of someone that followed your program or did your thing, your favorite testimonial? That's one right there. I love it. That's beautiful. So you already answered that. That's great. We didn't really talk about your book and the, the principles in it. So unfortunately, people are going to have to get it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> But <laughs> tell us a little bit about it below the podcast in the YouTube video on the blog post. I'm going to have uh, all your links to your content, to your social media, and even, oh my goodness, you have so many excellent YouTube videos that are so easy to take in. They're literally two to three minutes each, and each one has a nugget in it. It would be like a daily devotional for someone to go to your YouTube channel and just watch a different video every day. And I Thank think you. they should. Thank you. So the, the links are going to be on the podcast, on the show notes. But what can they expect from your book? Yeah, so Sustainable Excellence was a book I never expected to write. There's kind of an old joke that says, when we talk to God, it's called prayer. When God talks to us, it's called schizophrenia. So God has never talked to me and said, Terry, you should write a book. But I think what God did was put enough people in my path that were saying, hey, Terry, you should write a book. Hey, Terry, you should write a book. And I think I'm smart enough to kind of buck up, so to speak, and say, oh, maybe I ought to pay attention to these people. So Sustainable Excellence was really born out of two conversations that I had. One was with a former player that I had coached in high school, who'd moved to the area in Colorado where my wife and I live with her fiance. And the four of us had dinner one night. And I remember saying to her after dinner, hey, I'm really excited now that you're living close and I can watch you find and live your purpose. And Michael, she got real quiet for a while. And then she looked at me and she said, well, coach, what do you think my purpose is? And I said, I have no idea what your purpose is, but that's what your life should be about. Finding the reason you were put on the face of this earth, using your unique gifts and talents and living that reason. So that was one conversation. And then a young man reached out to me on social media and he asked me what I thought were the most important things that he should learn not to just be successful in his job or in business, but to be successful in life. And I didn't want to give him that get up early, work hard, help others. I didn't want to give him sort of the cliches that we all know. I wanted to see if I could go deeper with him. So I spent some time taking some notes and eventually had these 10 thoughts, these 10 ideas, these 10 principles. And so I sent them to him. And then I stepped back and I was like, well, I got a life story that fits underneath that principle, or I know somebody whose life emulates this principle. So literally during the months that I was healing after I had my leg amputated, I sat down at the computer every day and I built stories and they're real stories about real people underneath each of the principles. And that's how sustainable excellence came to be. I love it. Great. People get your copy. I'm going to, I haven't yet disappointed in myself for not having read it before this interview. I did watch probably a good, this might surprise you, probably 20 or more of your videos. They're that good. Thank you. And that's just getting started. I was hooked. It's like a, it's like a good book. I want to, I want to watch them all and I probably will. Thank you. So good stuff. 
All right. Well, Terry, man, what a pleasure, honor to have you on the Dr. Haley Show podcast. Truly blessed to know you. And I, I just want to thank you for all that you've done, all you're doing. You're awesome. You're a great example to us. Well, Michael, thank you very much for having me on. I, I really enjoy talking with you. And I, I, I hope that our conversation today will provide value to your audience. I that, That's my goal for every podcast, just to let somebody take something away from it that they didn't have before. Yeah, yeah. I know it does. It definitely does. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that episode today on The Dr. Haley Show. Make sure to hit subscribe on whichever platform you are listening to this. If this episode made you think of someone, go ahead, take a screenshot, and share this exact episode with them. You can catch the show notes for this episode on www.drhaley.com. If you want to geek out with Dr. Michael Haley on other radical health topics, be sure to check out his YouTube channel, where he posts exclusive video content. All the details are at www.drhaley.com, and we can't wait to hang out with you on the next episode.